Hey guys, and welcome to six things everyone will be doing better in three months from now in Age of Empires 4. When you're playing the Holy Roman Empire, you get an extra advantage from getting relics on the map. Every one-on-one -on -one match has five relics to be found. If you pick up a relic and place it in one of your monasteries, it generates 100 gold per minute. Keep in mind that every relic that you find also denies it to your opponent. So your 100 gold per minute is also denying your opponent a potential 100 gold per minute. As such, if both of you are looking for relics, every 100 gold per minute you get is actually worth 200 gold per minute in the balance between you and your economy and they and their economy. The Holy Roman Empire gets even more gold from relics in their monastery. Their H3 landmark, which is called the Rechnitz Cathedral, generates 300 gold per relic. So when you're Holy Roman Empire against another faction or vice versa, every relic that a Holy Roman finds is 300 gold per minute up to a maximum of three relics. After that, it will have the standard 100 gold per minute generation. That means for the first three relics that a Holy Roman Empire player finds or is denied by the opponent player, the difference in gold income is 400 gold, 300 plus 100. So that's a lot of gold per minute that matters. And as the game goes on, I think even that 100 gold per minute, when there's no Holy Roman Empire players in a game, can be really important as the game goes on. Rus often goes to the Third Age with their landmark that produces warrior monks, and those are mounted cavalry. They're fast, and it's very easy to just train one or two, pick up the relics and bring them back. And while mass conversion isn't though that powerful because it has a strong announcement on the map that someone is trying to convert your units with their monk holding a relic i think just the gold per minute and the denial to an opponent is going to get more and more important one of the interesting things is that with eight factions different factions have different prioritizations Rus hunt the animals and holy roman hunt the relics and everyone has their own little quirks as you play as or with or against Rus, you start to realize that the deer hunt matters. Same with Holy Roman Empire, you start to realize that the rel relics matter. And thus, playing with them in a game, you train your skill in that. And while now people think, oh, Holy Roman, I need to stop them getting relics, I think that's going to matter even in an English versus French game or an Abbasid Dynasty versus Delhi game. So I think there'll be a lot greater focus on relics. Nowadays, we still see high level games and games that are latter where relics are just completely ignored by both players. And I don't think that's going to be the case in three months from now. Next up, wall building to deny raids and scouting. Number two of things we'll be doing better. Well, we all know the value of walls because it denies scouting and stops cavalry raids. And it gives an advanced warning as well to people that are trying to defend their city against raids or all scale attacks. And while walls do have an opportunity cost of the villager that needs to make it, as well as the lumber that is required to build the wall, it seems there is a sweet spot in the game where you start to wall off your flanks at the very least. And oftentimes we'll forget to do it because we're too busy uh, with other things with the multitask. And as people get better at running their standard economy, defending, attacking, training and scouting, more mental acuity will be freed up uh, for making walls. And I think going for like a 20, 25 minute game without any uh, walls is gonna seem pretty unthinkable uh, as the game goes on. Additionally, and that's, this is a little sub point to this, getting the textiles upgrade for villager HP. It costs 20 seconds, it requires 150 resources, and it gives all your 50 HP villagers plus 25 HP for a maximum of 75 HP. Not getting this upgrade, the textiles upgrade, seems pretty insane. Uh, when when you could yeah, this one, imagine having like 80 villagers and not getting this upgrade because you fool yourself into thinking, no, I don't have time. I need more villagers. Uh, I need more greed. Well, how greedy is it if you lose five to ten villagers? So I think there is a sweet spot when to get it. I suspect it's not by the time you have 30 villagers. But once you're going over 60, 100% you should have it. And I think every player right now that's playing pro tourneys or, or is high on the ladder and is not getting this, it's an oversight more than really uh, it, it being like a smart choice or anything like that. All right, point number three. When playing as or against the Rus, we all become aware of their special price, their special bonus uh, gathering rates 
when they kill more animals on the map. Uh, so the way that roost works is when they kill deer, wolves, sheep, and boar, they get points for their bounty. And a big, bigger bounty gives them global resource gathering rates. And this is very powerful. So rust players will be sending their scouts to kill deer on the map as well as wolves. And smart counter players to roost will be doing the same thing to deny them their bonus. And then uh, roost is also able to very simply make scouts from their hunting cabins, which are gold generating food dropping off buildings that can also produce scouts. And because they now don't have to tie up their town center to make scouts, and they can actually make it from the hunting cabin, they're able to utilize this free production from the cabin to get a lot of scouts, more than other factions can, without sacrificing any town center uh, uptime at making villagers. And so we're all aware of that, and Rus has started to make use of the professional scouts upgrade, which is a rather expensive 350 resource upgrade, that allows them to one-shot deer, which is not that important, but it also allows them to pick up the corpses of deer, bring them back under the town center. Every one-on-one -on -one game has four deer hunts on the map, two relatively close to one player and two relatively close to the other. But it's kind of randomized, so you need to scout and find them. And the professional scouts, are, and every uh, deer hunt has like six to 10 deer in it. So this up, and every deer has 350 meat per corpse. So if you take this upgrade and you micro for a few minutes from the between the four to the seven minute mark and you bring back corpse after corpse after corpse with your scouts with your scouts you can get thousands of food under the relative safety of your town center right there where villagers are gathering it without needing to branch out and go on the map spread yourself thin and make yourself more harassable it started with the roost and now more and more people are getting it just to try and get a faster castle upgrade bringing those deer back and then getting the survival technique upgrade to gather hunted meat even faster has become a very valuable tool. And I think we're gonna see it more and more. When you know your opponent is getting it, when you get it as well, not just are you getting it, but you're also denying the carcasses to your opponent. Letting someone take all of the deer on the map and bring them back under their own town center can seem too much of an advantage to give up. So I think we're, we'll see it more and more in three months from now, uh, and we're already seeing it more. Then, point number four. I think we're gonna see more people playing the Chinese faction. And the Chinese faction has a huge potential. They can make spring ults in 10 seconds from their clock tower uh, landmark, H3 landmark. And all of the building, all of the siege units that they make from the uh, astronomical clock tower also have 50% bonus health. That means that Springles have 300 health instead of 200. That means that Springles, instead of getting three shot by other Springles, will need to be, let's see, 80, 30, and 80 will need to be four shot. So one more shot required. And it also makes their bomb bridge stronger and all that. Uh, this Springles may be nerfed in the patch that's coming up in a couple of days from now at the end of November, the beginning of December of 2021, but I suspect siege units will always have some kind of relevance and the astronomical clock tower does it best when it makes them. Not only that, but going into Song Dynasty allows you to make villagers faster. Every town center will count as one and a half town center when it comes to production output of villagers. That means anytime in the future of Age of Empires 4, if there's going to be a map that specializes in you sitting back, turtling, walling, and then booming, AKA making lots of villagers, building your economy before attacking an opponent, Chinese are gonna do it best. They're gonna have the most villager production, for every town center that you make, they make one as well. They go into Song Dynasty, their economy grows the most. And then they're gonna have late game upgrades that allows them to uh, have bonus range on their siege, such as uh, you, you're gonna have reload time of Bombards, makes their Bombards better, 33% better reload time. You're gonna get uh, Pyrotechnics, the range of all gunpowder units is gonna go up by 20%. Coupled with the fact that they have 50% more health and their Clock Tower Bombard, they can actually get 900 plus health that would require 12 shots from an enemy regular springle to take them down i think chinese are going to stand out as one of the top factions even if there wasn't going to be a patch in the next couple of days of course some maps like lipany or dry arabia chinese may not get a chance to unfurl their wings but we're talking about three months from now and as it is also a hard faction a hard civilization to play 
people are already starting to practice them more and more, I think it's going to take some time to see their full potential. And I think we're going to see it. Also, when looking at their palace guard, their equivalent of a man at arms, the palace guard says it's got reduced armor, but it's faster than men at arms. So let's actually value these. The palace guard moves at something like 1.5 move speed instead of 1.12, making them way faster than a men at arms. And all they sacrifice is one single point of armor that makes them better at raiding, it makes them better at chasing down enemy siege units and closing the gap on archers and crossbowmen and so on. And just straight up giving one single objective, subjective opinion on it, I think palace guard are just better than men at arms. The only thing they're worse at is that they, in a straight up clash against enemy men at arms, clash against clash, they're gonna have one armor less and that movement speed won't matter. But I think people are gonna get better at choosing their fights, doing harass, doing mobility, rather than just A moving into each other. They are of course not endowed with some special upgrades like the English one with plus two armor or the Holy Roman with a slew of bonus damage. Just when comparing them to regular men at arms like from the French that have no bonuses, I think uh, the palace guard is better. That movement speed is more valuable than the one armor. The fifth point that I think everyone will be doing better in three months from now is making outposts primarily for vision. Different factions have different reasons to go for outposts. For instance, when you're Mongol, you get the deer stones, you get the Yam network technology. You can also upgrade this in the outpost with another landmark, but then you have to wait until Castle Age and it says Yam RS speed applies to all units instead of just traders and cavalry units. Getting the YAM network at Feudal or at Castle, either way, you can extend the YAM network movement speed aura with outposts. A large radius is provided alongside Mongol outposts. And what you notice as a Mongol player is that besides all that movement speed that you like to use, you're also getting a lot of vision on the map. It's equivalent to the StarCraft II creep tumor vision. It's a advanced warning signal, even when you don't upgrade emplacements to make them an independent fighter. And that extra vision is a very powerful tool. In a game of vision and vision denial and fog of war, in an RTS like Age of Empires 4 and many others, vision is very important. And for the investment of 70 lumber, 70 wood for the Mongols and 100 wood for many of the other factions, it seems like a small price to pay to be able to see over stealth forests, to have advanced warnings, and not just to work with walls that have to be built in a large segment, but just an outpost here and there at a sacred site or on a flank or near an opponent, a small investment to make. And I think we'll see more of that. Number six, stone attack walls. Stone attack walls are uh, uh, something, uh, a cheese that has emerged recently. And there's a few ways to make stone attack walls. And if we, if we boot up a game, I can show you exactly how. Basically, stone walls are a cool way to give extra bonus to your ranged units. Ranged units benefit 66% damage reduction, AKA they're taking one third of the damage they otherwise would when they're standing on a stone wall. This also counts for melee units, by the way. And ranged units also get plus two range when they're on top of a stone wall. That actually means that a longbowman from the English on top of a stone wall can outrange the town center, which only has eight range. So if someone makes a stone wall all the way towards your town center and then puts their longbowman on it, well, they can attack your town center. Not that they will kill it quickly. It takes a while. They only do the one damage and pop, but they can start harassing villagers underneath it and so on. Stone wall per segment costs just 15 lumber. Uh, of course, you cannot make a single point uh, of lumber, uh, uh, stone, sorry, 15 stone. And the smallest uh, amount that you can invest is 45 stone. So if you were to make a 45 stone wall and you wanted to get on top of it to attack, 45 stone is not a big investment. Now, currently, I cannot make any units go on top of the wall because there is no entry point. And there's a few ways to open the point. One is with a stone wall gate, which allows you to jump in only from the side where a little door will be made, which is uh, the side that the arrow is not facing. Uh, so you can jump on top of the wall via that. You can also make a stone wall tower, but this one takes twice as long to make and costs four times as much stone. The stone wall tower can be upgraded it already fires a spring out and it can be upgraded to have certain bonuses, I suppose, but it takes much longer to make. The stone wall gate is the cheaper way to get on top compared to the stone wall tower. 
But there's three other ways to get on top of a stone wall, namely units can build a siege tower in 20 seconds for just 100 lumber you can load eight units on top of it and then you can go on top of the stone wall with that siege tower but there's two other ways one wall segments can be destroyed you can destroy your opponent's wall segments and then anyone can jump on top of them but you can also just hold the delete key on your own stall uh, own stone wall segments which will allow a walk up point as well you can then go on top and utilize the advantage of 66% damage reduction from ranged and siege attacks and having that increased range. Keep in mind that enemy players can also walk up that very same path if they get a couple of melee men at arms on top and your longbowmen are here, no damage reduction will be taken by the longbowmen. So they will be slaughtered without an escape point. But if you control the entry point, you can even start a long stone wall all the way to your opponent's base from way back far and then you can basically take the highway the magnetic levitation train all the way to uh, the city of your opponent and start harassing them with longbowmen while some of this may seem like meme or cheese or too much attention building a little stone wall during a fight at an important control point i think is something that we're gonna see more and when we see it we're gonna feel like that's so cool when it actually gets used in like a, a prize money game those were the six points I think we're going to be doing better at. Let's see if I'm right. Exclamation mark, remind me, February 29th.